This episode is brought to you in association with Janice Henderson Investors. It is a marketing communication, not for onward distribution, and the value of an investment can fall as well as rise. And you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Past performance does not predict future returns, and nothing in this episode should be construed as advice. Our discussion is for illustrative purposes only. References made to individual securities does not constitute a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any security, investment strategy, market sector, and should not be assumed to be profitable. Janus Henderson Investors, its affiliated advisor or its employees may have a position in the securities mentioned. Not for onward distribution in European Union member countries. My name is Jamie Ross, fund manager of Henderson Eurotrust, and I'm here today with David Barker, who's an analyst who works with me on, on the trust. We're going to do a podcast series called Cutting Through the Noise. And the intention is to discuss something topical or thematic in the market um, and discuss how that particular theme impacts the portfolio and the kind of decisions that we're making and the kind of thought processes and debates that we're having. And today we're going to start with the cost of living crisis. Now, as a caveat before we start, obviously this issue has widespread ramifications, both you know, moral, economic, socio-political implications. We're not going to focus on any of that. We're going to talk purely about the investment implications of, of this particular theme, and we'll run through some sectors and how we see those sectors and, and particular stocks, both in the portfolio and outside the portfolio, as being impacted by this theme. So let's start in a really obvious place and talk about the, um, the possibility of demand destruction in some of the consumer-facing sectors, starting with disc uh, uh, consumer discretionary. And for this, I'll hand straight over to David to kick things off. Thanks, Jamie. And, and typically during a period of, of consumer slowdown, we see the, the first signs of slowdown in the consumer discretionary uh, areas, whether that's in uh, fashion, furniture, or home improvement. And we've already started to see some quite large companies globally talk about a slowdown in demand, whether that's H&M or Logitech in Europe or some of the large retailers in the US like Home Depot or Walmart. Um, where that issue has been very acute in Europe and we really see, see it come to fruition is in uh, online fashion. Um, companies like Zalando and, uh, and ASOS that had very strong COVIDs where people were staying at home and, and ordering a lot of clothes at home, you've seen demand really fall off from, from actually quite a high base. And also during that period, you also saw valuations for these these types of companies, e-commerce in in and in, uh, in Europe and also internet in general, mm. um, really go to quite high levels. So what what you've seen um, is e-commerce companies like Zalando really really struggle to perform. Um, yeah. Zalando, for example, fell fifty five percent, I think, relative to the index this year. We don't typically have a, a particularly strong um, focus on on retail in general in, in the trust. No, we haven't done we haven't done for a while, and it's it's the right area to talk about first because we're already seeing the weakness here. You know, it's not an area that we're speculating. We might see some weakness. It's already very clear in both the share prices and the operational performances. Historically, we've had a bit of e-commerce exposure. You know, this isn't a bad sector long term. You know, the structural drivers are interesting. But in more recent years, we've, we've cut back on our exposure and actually have very little at the moment. Um, you know, where we have really avoided exposure almost entirely has been general retail kind of non e-commerce -e type operations. So, you know, food retailers or the bricks and mortar, uh, fashion retailers, you know, very little exposure. And really that's not so much because of this weakening consumer environment, but just because actually we don't like, don't really like the business models in a lot of those areas. So very little exposure here. Um, three positions that I suppose touch this space that we do have exposure to. Delivery Hero in a very small position, HelloFresh, another small position, and, and Adidas. So an area that we're, we're keen, to, keen to avoid in this environment. But it brings us on to um, an area that we prefer, um, still consumer, still very discretionary, but we think an area that would be a bit more resilient, and that's luxury. It's kind of a difficult topic because at first glance, and we've debated this a lot, but at first glance, Luxury is the most discretionary of items you can possibly imagine. You know, you don't need a bespoke suit. You don't need a scarf. Well, you need a scarf, but not a 500 pound scarf. You know, you don't need a, 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 a Birkin bag from Hermes. But actually, history has shown that that area of the market tends to be super resilient uh, in times of economic stress. 
And, and really the reason for that is that actually only a very small portion of people globally can afford luxury goods. And these luxury goods companies, only about a third of their customers provide something like 80% of revenues. So the ultra-rich really drive defensiveness in, in, in these companies. And that is one reason why in this environment where times are a bit tough for, for you and I and for you know, the, certainly the you know, man on the street, man, woman on the street, the ultra wealthy hold up this sector quite, quite, quite well. Uh, and and just to, to talk about the historical performance of these businesses, uh, LVMH, which you know is the is the largest luxury house uh, globally, performed very very resiliently through the financial crisis. So, the the largest business, the fashion and leather goods business, uh, fell two sales fell two percent only for one quarter during the crisis, and the business was back to growing double digit within three quarters. Mm. Another another position that we have quite large exposure to is Hermes. That business still grew high single digit throughout the crisis, and that really was driven by by pricing and, as you say, um, the the high net worth individuals kind of holding up demand. Exactly. So you know, so in this environment, you know, we can see a reason to still maintain exposure to these luxury companies. And the other thing to bear in mind here is that you know we don't just make decisions based on how we see the environment over a six month or twelve month period. We'd like these businesses, and we like these businesses because they have high gross profit margins, they have high return on capital, good growth exposure, and they have pricing power. LVMH, which you mentioned earlier, David, LVMH has has something like doubled its price points on its core range over the last seven years without impacting volume demand. So high quality businesses and an area of consumer that we actually think will be pretty resilient um, in, in, the, in this tough environment. Let's move from an area where we do have exposure and that we've long debated to an area where we have no exposure, but once did, an area that we see as potentially being impacted by this environment, that's autos. Yeah, and, and autos is typically a sector that you, you really think does get acutely affected in a slowdown. If you think back to 2008-09, global uh, light vehicle production fell 4% in 2008 and fell 12% in, in 2009. And we can all think back to the, the awful uh, headlines we were seeing, seeing about job cuts in the automotive industry back then. Um, you know, so typically in any given cycle, these businesses are very cyclical. Their margins are, are very volatile. There's a very big fixed cost base. Um, so why should we think that this is any different this time? Now, auto companies have come out a very unique situation through COVID. Mm -hmm. The supply chain is very constrained, so they can't get hold of semiconductors. They can't get hold of, of parts. And what's that? what that's meant is you've seen auto OEM backlogs really start to balloon. So if you or I want to go out and buy a BMW or a Mercedes, we've got to wait six, six months, 12 months before that gets delivered. And what that's meant for auto EMs is, is they've been able to be very selective on pricing. So you've seen pricing go up for new cars. And also they've been able to prioritize um, producing the most high margin cars. So big high priced SUVs or limousines in the case of Mercedes. And what that's meant is the OEMs have, have seen margins at all time highs, um, whether you're a Stellantis at the lower end, whether you're premium OEM at the middle end or even the, the luxury OEM. So it's a, it's a slightly different setup to normal. Um, however, you know, demand is demand, right? And in the US, 90% of new, new cars are purchased on finance. Yeah. It's very similar. It's very similar to, to that in the UK. And, you know, what's going to happen when, when people's mortgage payments are going up, people's uh, bills are going up, and also their car repayments are going up. And, you know, that, I think that's where I'm, I'm still reasonably concerned. And, and you, you touched on what we've done in the portfolio. There. Yeah. It, and also, you know, one of the key things we've debated here is the age old question of, is it different this time? You know, is this time different for the autos where we we have I can't, I'm, I can't I've lost track of the number of meetings we've had with auto company CEOs and CFOs. And, and the key message is that they've changed. We've you know, we've got margin discipline now and that we are going to be firm on pricing. But you worry that if that really is going to be the case when when demand starts to weaken and and that's something that concerns us. So what have we done? You know, so 12 months ago, we held two positions in the sector. We held a, an, an OEM, so a manufacturer, Stellantis, and we actually held a parts company as well for Asia. And very specific reasons why we owned them. But, you know, our fear has grown over the last 12 months that they are over earning, that margins could come down and that the demand side of things may weaken. Um, especially on the debt funded side of the purchases. So we sold both positions in the last 12 months and have no exposure to autos. So it's a good example of the kind of debate we've had, 
that's resulted in positioning changes. You know, we need to be aware of the consumer environment and what that might mean for the stocks and sectors. And we talked a lot about that, a lot there about the consumer discretionary side, but typically in you know periods of slowdown, consumer staples hold up very well. So, what have we done there, and what are we what are we thinking there? Yeah. So obviously, a traditionally very defensive sector. And I'd also say that it's a sector that throughout you know, the history of Eurotrust, we tended to have had some quite decent exposure to. And there's good reason for that. You know, these companies tend to have, they tend to have pricing power. The brand heritage gives them pricing power. They tend to have high margin structures, high returns, and they tend to have stable and defensive growth profiles. But what about in this environment? You know, what about an environment where the, the consumer is weakening? Well, firstly, we don't expect to see too much volume weakness. So let's use an extreme example. You know, if you if you lose your job, are you are you more or less likely to buy a car in the next twelve months? And conversely, will it impact your decision on what cereal you're buying next week? You know, it's much more likely to impact the former than the latter. So the demand environment, the volume environment, should be okay, um, and that's an attractive feature. But there is another thing at play here, which is all about down trading. So in tougher times, are you more likely to buy um, a, a two pound fifty yogurt? from the supermarket that's that's brand your favorite brand or could you you know dip into down trading and, and go for the white label equivalent and that becomes more likely so staples companies volumes will be defensive and we really think that's the case but mix so the down trading could really start to impact the business have we approached it we've got healthy exposure to the sector we see some really attractive businesses here so Pono ricard um french spirits company a very high quality owner of some very important, um, strong heritage brands uh, within the spirits categories. And then we own Nestle, which is a food business, uh, actually increasingly a coffee and a pet food business, but very well managed, very defensive, resilient profile, very decent margins that they make on, on most of their products. And then at the other end of things, we actually have a couple of staples companies in the portfolio where we have small positions in businesses going through a real turnaround. And in this environment, that's very interesting because if we're in a tough environment where everyone is struggling a little bit to get that customer in the door and to avoid down trading, it's quite attractive if there's some internally generated um, progress in the business. And we own Danone, which I, I briefly mentioned via talking about yogurts earlier, predominantly a dairy business and a specialized food business. Um, and we also own Beiersdorf, which is um, a peer to L'Oreal. Uh, most people would regard it historically as being not quite as good a performer as L'Oreal, but it's a, a much cheaper valuation. Both businesses have seen management change, a slight change in approach, and have started to really see the benefit of that, but early stages and so small positions for us. So a good sector, a defensive sector, but we've got to be aware that down trading is a risk depending on the on the category. Um, we've, we've spoken a lot about consumer. But of course, anything that happens in the in the consumer world, um, you know, feeds through to the industrial world. And the fact that the consumer is feeling not very confident also quite often feeds through to the industrialist not feeling mm. that confident. So, David, what about industrials? What's been our debate and approach here? Yeah, well, as you say, we, we've already started to see the Euro European PMI, which is a survey of, of manufacturing management, come down quite precipitously. Um, at the start of the year, the PMI was at 58, and that's now fallen to below uh, 50 as of August. And what's that telling you? That's essentially manufacturing uh, management teams um, being more concerned about the demand environment and also still seeing very acute supply issues that are, that are making it more difficult for them to actually deliver product. And as a result, we've seen very high backlogs uh, in, in the sector. In industrials, the, prog the end market prognosis is very mixed. Um, so we think you know, the, the best way to approach the sector is to be quite selective. Um, in the trust, we own ABB, which is an electrification provider. What they essentially do is enable industrial companies to be more efficient in their manufacturing uh, footprint. And at a time when energy, you know, wholesale gas prices are where they are, that can be a very valuable value, value generative purchase for, for an industrial company. So we still see very strong order momentum there. Um, another end market where we still see good momentum is in mining and mining capex um, as the uh, global economy has tried to de-bottleneck, but also as we've seen um, new new uh, applications like electric vehicles, which are very um, rich in copper and, and uh, metals like uh, lithium and cobalt. That's been very beneficial to, to, cap to capex for, for the mining industry. Sorry to interrupt, but it's actually worth mentioning the link between those two as well. 
you know, because one of the things we try to do with Eurotrust is to, you know, to invest in a sustainable way. You know, we do consider ESG factors and actually both of those businesses, you know, both electrification focused ABB, but also the mining CapEx focused business we own, which is Metso, both of those are playing into end markets that have a very important role to play in electrification and in decarbonisation um, on, on, on a long term basis. And, and going back to being selective, there are also areas uh, where we don't want any exposure at the moment at all. Um, construction globally is, is an area both in the residential and non-residential space where we're, we're concerned about demand. In residential, obviously, higher interest rate environments makes mortgages more uh, unaffordable. Um, it reduces the number of house, house sales and also it reduces the amount of housing starts. Um, that's that's bad for, for residential construction exposed companies in Europe. We also saw in 2021 and 2020 during the COVID pandemic, a huge boom in home renovations as people stayed at home and had savings to to spend. And we've really started to see that that falling off. So within the trust, we have elected to have no direct exposure to, to residential construction. And then on the non-resi side, China has been the real theme. Um, you've seen developers like Evergrande um, coming, coming under financial distress. Um, and as a result, you've seen huge numbers of projects essentially being stopped. And what does that mean for, for large exporting European construction companies like Kone? You've really seen orders start to slow down. Now, Kone is an example of a, a European company that's very high quality in the type of company maybe we would like to own, mm. but we we don't feel comfortable owning uh, owning a company like that with this kind of end market market outlook. I think that's a key point. And again, hopefully highlight some of the debate that Dave and I have on the desk. You know, there are a lot of companies that we would like to own, but we have to think about the environment at the moment that they're, that they're faced with and the environment that they might be faced with over the next couple of years. Kono is a great example of that. We can't talk about industrials without without mentioning Keon. Um, yeah, it's been a um, well. Keon's been a, a kind of core position for us um, for a little while. Why do we like Keon? Keon's a German company with exposure to um, well industrial trucks, so forklift trucks, and also to warehouse automation. We in particular really like the warehouse automation business. Simply put, warehouses globally are not that automated, and we think that automation um, penetration will increase a lot. Um, over the next 10 years, over the next 15 years, and Keon will have a big part to play. But in the short term, these kind of issues that we've discussed earlier on in, in, this, in this video um, about the consumer getting squeezed, about inflation, they impact the industrial world as well. You know? And Keon has really struggled with a higher raw material um, cost base and an inability to instantly pass that on to its own customers. It's suffered from supply chain issues as well as that inflation. And it's also, and again, this, this is related to the consumer environment we discussed earlier, it's seeing some demand weakness. You know, really simply put, why is it seeing demand weakness? Why is a customer, for example, the Amazons of this world, why are they demanding less warehouse automation right now? It's because they spent a lot on warehouse automation and warehouse in general during the conditions created by COVID. And then afterwards, consumer demand weakens a bit for their goods and services. And so their demand in turn weakens for, for the, their kind of capex spending plan. So Keon struggled a bit. We've maintained the faith there. We think that the future is bright for Keon, but the conditions at the moment are very tough. And then the final area that I wanted to touch on within industrials or broadly within industrials is semiconductors. Um, now, this is an area that, you know, one might describe as the canary in the coal mine. You know, the semiconductor companies tend to see vicious cycles and they tend to see conditions change and impact the business very early, both on the downswings in cycles and on the upswings as well. And so far this year, we've seen a number of warnings from companies within the semiconductor um, value chain, especially those exposed to more consumer facing end markets. You know, if people are buying less smartphones, semiconductor demand for the kind of semis that would go into a smartphone falls as well and the, and the companies suffer as a result. So some pockets of weakness there. But it's an interesting topic because for us, this weakness is something that is, is creating opportunities for us. We came into the year with not much semiconductor exposure at all. And now we've added two semiconductor companies in the last three to four months. And we've done that in a small way. We are aware that conditions are tough and could remain tough. But the semiconductor equipment companies in particular, which is where we've established our positioning, uh, in particular, by the way, in, in B Semiconductor um, and in ASM, and we had a long um, established position in ASML as well. These are good companies. 
you know, 60% plus gross profit margins, you know, 20% plus operating profit margins, high return on capital and exposure to structural growth. So it's not all bad. You know, a tough consumer environment that feeds through to the industrial world creates opportunities and we're trying to find some of the best of those. So let's summarize. We started on consumer and within the consumer space, luxury is an area that still appeals to us. Um, we think that would be a resilient area. The more general retail we think will, will, will struggle and is struggling at the moment a little bit. Staples historically has been a really mm. good, good kind of defensive area and we think that remains the case. Within industrials, a hugely complex sector many different end markets, many different impacts from the environment we're seeing today really have to be selective, really have to meet the meet the companies and understand the businesses. Um, and then where do we get defensiveness? Pharmaceuticals, we like that space. Staples, I mentioned earlier. Um, and then slightly bizarrely in a, in a, in a defensive um, debate would be exchanges and aerospace. So I hope you've enjoyed that. And we'll try and do a couple of these a year and talk about themes that we think are, I suppose, the most interesting debates that we're having on the desk at any one point. Thank you. Glossary terms. Automotive OEM OEM stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer. The OEM is the original producer of a vehicle's components, and so OEM car parts are identical to the parts used in producing a vehicle. Barbell approach, the barbell strategy is an investment concept that suggests that the best way to strike a balance between reward and risk is to invest in the two extremes of high risk and no risk assets while avoiding middle of the road choices. Capital expenditure, capex, spending on fixed assets such as buildings, machinery, equipment and vehicles in order to increase the capacity or efficiency of a company. Cyclical, a cyclical stock is a stock that's price is affected by macroeconomic or systematic changes in the overall economy. Cyclical stocks are known for following the cycles of an economy through expansion, peak, recession, and recovery. Defensive sector stock, a defensive stock is a stock that provides consistent dividends and stable earnings regardless of the state of the overall stock market. Inflation, the rate at which the prices of goods and services are rising in an economy. The CPI and RPI are two common measures. The opposite of deflation. Valuations, valuation is the analytical process of determining the current, or projected, worth of an asset or a company. There are many techniques used for doing a valuation. Volatility, the rate and extent at which the price of a portfolio, security or index, moves up and down. If the price swings up and down with large movements, it has high volatility. If the price moves more slowly and to a lesser extent, it has lower volatility. Higher volatility means the higher the risk of the investment. Not for onward distribution. Before investing in an investment trust referred to in this document, you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved, you may wish to consult a financial advisor. This is a marketing communication. Please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and annual report of the AIF before making any final investment decisions. Past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise and you may not get back the amount originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend upon an investor's particular circumstances and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this document is intended to or should be construed as advice. This document is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection, to improve customer service and for regulatory record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Jane Us Henderson Investors. Janus Henderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services are provided by Janus Henderson Investors International Limited, Reg No. 3594615, Janus Henderson Investors UK Limited, Reg No. 906355, Janus Henderson Fund Management UK Limited, Reg No. 2678531, Henderson Equity Partners Limited, Reg Number 260666 for 6, each registered in England and Wales at 201 Bishopsgate, 
London EC2 M3AE, and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, and Jane Us Henderson Investors Europe SA, Reg No. B2284 8 at 2 Rue de Bitbourg, L1273, Luxembourg and regulated by the Commission de Surveillance du Secteur Financier. Janus Henderson, Knowledge Shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janus Henderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright symbol Janus Henderson Group PLC.